الله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم I begin in the name of the Almighty God, the Compassionate, the Merciful. The one who has created everything in utmost perfection. And may the peace and blessings of the Almighty God be upon his pure and beloved messenger, the peak of his creation, the symbol of humanity, the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. And his immaculate progeny of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, especially the leader of our time, the awaited Savior, Al Imam Al Mahdi, Ajjalallahu Ta'ala Faraja. Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. All prophets of God, those who were messengers, who had a message and were challenged by their people, were equipped by a miracle from the Almighty God to demonstrate the truthfulness of their message. However, when we examine the miracles of all the prophets, we find that they were ephemer ephemeral miracles. They were temporary miracles that only applied in that time. For example, Prophet Musa salam, one of his miracles was splitting the sea. One of his miracles was that the stick turned into a python. Is this something that later generations had the opportunity to witness? No. Only if you were present at that time, you witnessed that miracle. But if you came later on, you did not witness the miracle. Therefore, the miracles of all prophets were bound by their time. Yes, previous generations came to hear about them, but they did not actually witness the miracle. There is only one exception to this system. And that is the final miracle of God at the hands of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and that is the Holy Quran. Because the religion of Islam would be the final religion that would complete all other previous religions, Allah wanted to give humanity a miracle that would last throughout history. A miracle that even though you did not live at the time of the Prophet, you could actually experience it. You could actually witness that miracle. And that is the Holy Quran. It's a miracle across the generations. Unlike the miracle of every previous Prophet, which was bound by their time, the Quran is a miracle that transcends time. So that all generations have the opportunity to experience this miraculous book, delivered to us by the Almighty God. When the Prophet ﷺ brought the Qur'an, we have to understand the makeup of his society to really understand how the Qur'an served as proof that it was from the Almighty God. The Qur'an contains many types of miracles. One night we briefly talked about the scientific miracles in the Qur'an. That's one aspect. The content of the Qur'an is miraculous. And we are required to study the content. A lot of people today, most Muslims are not Arabs. And they don't speak the Arabic language. And they wonder, how do I really know that this Quran is a miracle from God? I'm not an eloquent Arabic speaker who knows the literary features of the Quran for me to see that this is a miracle from God. Or to appreciate the beauty of the Quran. Well, study the content of the Quran. The content of the Qur'an is miraculous. The scientific miracles mentioned in the Holy Qur'an. If you look at the legal system that the Qur'an brought, it's, it's miraculous. How a man during those times who grew up in Arabia, which was away from the center of knowledge and learning, could produce such a legal system for you. The Qur'an has predictions. On one night in the Arabic part, we talked about Abu Lahab and Surah Al-Masad. The Qur'an predicted that he would die as an unbeliever, and that happened. The Qur'an in the chapter of the Romans predicted that the Romans would achieve victory over the Persians within a few years, and that happened. And there are so many other predictions in the Holy Qur'an. That in itself reveals the miraculous nature of the Holy Qur'an. Then you also have the elaborate verses that talk about the human psychology, that talk about sociology and how our society is structured, that talk about the human being and his relationship with his family, with his friends, with his creator. 
The content of the Quran is truly miraculous. It gives you the recipe for success. It prepares you for the Akhirah. Having said that, one amazing dimension of the Quran is the literary dimension. The miraculous eloquence contained in the Holy Quran. When the Prophet ﷺ brought the Quran, the Arabs were known for their eloquence. See, all civilizations are known for something. The Greeks, the Romans, they were known, for example, for their architecture. The Chinese are known for certain features in their history. The Persians are known for certain accomplishments. What were the accomplishments of the Arabs? What was the highest form of art that they had? It was eloquence. In fact, before Islam, during the Jahili period, you would find that many Arab poets, once a year, for about two weeks, they would go to the market of Akkad. It was a very well-known market by the city of Ta'if. It was a seasonal market that lasted for about two weeks. It was the biggest market in Arabia. People went there to trade, to discuss important matters, and also to flex their poetic muscles. The top poets would come and they would speak their poetry. The highest form of art that the Arabs had was poetry. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delivers the Holy Quran to challenge their highest form of art. Even though the Quran is not a book of poetry. And the main intent of the Quran is not to be a book of just literary tools and expressions. The main concern of the Quran is guidance, to deliver guidance. But Allah used Arabic eloquence and literature in order to deliver that guidance in a way that no human being at the time could produce anything like. Suddenly, after 40 years, the Prophet was never schooled. He never wrote or read anything. He grew up an orphan, away from the centers of knowledge. He never went to any university. Suddenly, he starts producing a book that is miraculous in every aspect. Something that no one could produce anything like. And the Quran is inviting us to think. How can a man after 40 years who was not known for any of this, suddenly he produce, produce, produces a book like that. This in itself reminds us that the Holy Quran is from a higher source and it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you examine the depths of the Quran, my dear brothers and sisters, you are truly mesmerized by the power of the words, by the precision, the amazing precision and conciseness of all the words in the Holy Quran. And what's amazing about the Quran and about this book, unlike any other author, unlike any other poet, is that you find that the Quran has the same strength throughout. Take a look at the life of any poet any writer or author, you see that at some points in their lives, they were experimenting. They started to get better and better and better until they start producing a masterpiece, right? Do you know of an author, throughout their entire years of producing their work, they produced flawless, impeccable work? There's no such author in history. In fact, every poet has certain poetry that they're ashamed and embarrassed of. It was a weak poem. It wasn't my best of days. Except the Holy Quran. From beginning to, to, to the end, you find it at the same literary power. At the same concentration, the same depth. It's truly amazing. And remember the Prophet ﷺ, during those 23 years, he went through a number of conditions. Sometimes he would be at peace, sometimes in the battle, on the battlefield, he was tired, he was hungry, he was full, he was with his companions, he was resting, he was traveling. In all of these states, we find the Quran coming in one power. What does this tell you? When you're, when you're tired, you're in the battlefield, does your brain and mind work like if you're sitting, looking at a garden and you're composing poetry or writing a book? Obviously not. When you're in the battlefield, can you even concentrate on your work? But we find that almost one third of the Quran was revealed in battles and battlefields. Isn't that an indication of the miraculous nature of the Holy Quran? Who could do that in history? Maintain one uniform level of conciseness and power. 
I would like to share with you in our discussion tonight, my dear brothers and sisters, especially for those who don't speak Arabic and who want to know the power of eloquence in the Holy Quran, even though I do recommend them to study Arabic. Remember, the English translation is not the actual word of God. It's the word of a human being who's capturing for you what he thinks is the word of God. If you want to read the actual word of God, you read it in Arabic. Directly, you expose yourself to the beautiful words of the Almighty God. So it's highly recommended that we do study Arabic to better appreciate the Quran. But if you don't know Arabic, I want to share with you some examples of the precision and the power of eloquence in the Holy Quran to appreciate it. And what's amazing about the Quran, my dear brothers and sisters, that it's so dynamic in every age, in every circumstance, people always find new treasures from this book. For 1,400 years, every single day, there is someone who discovers something new about the Quran. They say once there was a university professor who was critical of the Quran and Islam, and he asked his students in class, is there any Muslim here? A few students raised their hand, and they said, yes, we're Muslims. Why? He said, I have a challenge for you. Do you really believe that the Quran is the word of God and that every word is very precise? They said, yes. He's like, I have a challenge. They're like, what? He quoted a verse from Surah Al-Ahzab in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, مَا جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِرَجُلٍ مِنْ قَلْبَيْنِ فِي جَوْفِهِ Allah has not placed two hearts inside of a man. Now the verse doesn't say inside of a human or a person, it says rajul, man. He says, you guys claim the Quran is very precise. Well, why does the Quran say that? Is the Quran suggesting that women have two hearts? Only men, they don't have two hearts inside of them? What is this? The Quran is not precise. There was one student, he did not know initially how to respond, but he started thinking, contemplating, oh Allah, you know, give me the answer here. What should I do? And then subhanAllah, an amazing thought was sparked in his mind. He got up, he said, no, we believe in this verse and there is a reason why God said that. The Quran is actually very precise. He's like, what, you Muslims believe that women can have two hearts? He says, no, it's not Muslims. Every person knows that women can have two hearts because biology shows us that. He says, what do you mean? He says, a man does not have two hearts, generally speaking, he has one heart. But a woman, when she's pregnant, she can have two hearts inside of her. Her heart and the heart of her child, right? The heart of her fetus. And remember, the Quran doesn't say sadr in, in the chest. The Quran says inside jawf. Inside of a man, there aren't two hearts. By the way, this is not the tafsir of the verse. It has another tafsir. But you find that the Holy Quran, what's amazing about it, even the words that God uses are so precise, no one can challenge them for 1,400 years. Having said that, Let's talk about some of the amazing features of the Holy Quran to give you some examples of how precise the wording is of the Holy Quran. One example that I'd like to share with you is a conversation between Prophet Ibrahim and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is in Surah Al-Shu'ara. Prophet Ibrahim is talking about God and the favors of God on us. So he says, الَّذِي خَلَقَنِي فَهُوَ يَهْدِينَ Allah is the one who created me and He is the one, Fahuwa. The Quran brings this pronoun for emphasis. And He is the one who guides me. Then He says, And He is the one who feeds me and gives me water to drink. When I get sick, He is the one who heals me. He is the one who cures me. Now in these three verses, we see that there is this pronoun, huwa. He is the one. He is the one for emphasis. But in the following verse, وَالَّذِي يُمِيتُنِي ثُمَّ يحين. And he is the one who takes my life, he gives me death, and he revives me. We don't see this emphasis here. He doesn't say, وَالَّذِي هُوَ يُمِيتُنِي ثُمَّ يحين. He just says, and he's the one. And... It just brings you a conjunction. It doesn't say who, he is the one. And the one who gives me death and life. 
Why? The Quran is very precise. There's a reason why in those three verses, Allah says, Huwa, He is the one. He is the one. But over here, Allah didn't say it. And the one. And He. In Arabic, And the one. He doesn't say He. There is no added emphasis. Why? When it comes to those three earlier verses, Prophet Ibrahim السلام, is making a point that maybe others in society can feed you, you can go to the doctor, the doctor can heal you, but there required an emphasis. No, he is the one who actually feeds you. Don't be fooled. Yes, you go to the doctor, but he is the one who actually cures you. Because other people might forget that Allah is the one who's taking care of them. But when it comes to reviving you, creating you, do you need that added emphasis? You don't need that added emphasis. Why? Because everyone knows that a doctor can't revive anyone. A doctor cannot give you life or death. It's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because it's so obvious, it did not require this emphasis. Look at the precision of the Holy Quran. That's one example. Another example, we find that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Prophet Zakaria alayhi salam, and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted them a child later on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Maryam captures the dua of Prophet Zakaria. What did he say? Remember, he was childless until he became old and his wife became old. Oh Allah. How can I have a child now? Because Allah gave him news, you will have a child. And my imra'a, my woman, he doesn't say my zawja, my wife. He says, and my woman is barren. She's old. She's infertile now. She cannot give a child anymore. When we look at this verse, we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word imra'a to refer to his wife. But in another verse, in Surah Al-Anbiya, when Allah says we answered his prayer, and we gave him a son, and now they have a child, how does Allah refer to his wife? Allah doesn't say imra'a. What does Allah say? Zawj. فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ وَوَهَبْنَا لَهُ يَحْيَى We gave him Yahya, we answered his prayer. وَأَصْلَحْنَا لَهُ زَوْجَةِ And we made his wife to have the ability to give a child. Question why? Why in one verse Allah said woman? In another verse he said wife, she, she was his wife. Even when she did not have Yahya, she was his wife. Why? Because in Arabic when you say the word zawj, spouse, it comes from the word zawaj, marriage. And usually for a marriage to be complete, what do you have in a marriage? You have children, right? People get married for one primary reason of having children, to have a family. Up until that moment when she did not have a child, it seems the marriage was incomplete. That's why Prophet Zakaria was distressed. Oh Allah, give me a son. So we have a family, we can continue this marriage and continue this family. So when she did not have a child, the Quran referred to her using the word imra'a. But when she had a child, the Quran uses the word zawj. Subhanallah, look at the precision of the Holy Quran. Sometimes we just pass by and we forget these amazing details. Now how is it that someone 14 centuries ago receiving these verses, and remember they were not written, and he's giving these signs, but he would be so precise with these words. This is an indication that there was a higher power. This is an example. Another example is the word choice that the Holy Quran uses to refer to the sun and the, and the moon. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Furqan talks about the sun, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَجَعَلَ فِيهَا سِرَاجًا وَقَمَرًا مُنِيرًا When Allah describes the sun, Allah uses the word siraj. But when He describes the moon, He says the word munir. Both of them mean to give light. But what's the difference? Siraj was an oil lamp that the Arabs would use. And a lamp, an oil lamp that you have to light, what does it generate other than light? It generates heat as well. A siraj is a lamp that generates heat. So Allah uses this word for the sun because the, the, the sun generates heat. Whereas the moon, it does not generate heat. 
So the Quran does not use that word for it. Allah says munir. Yes, it's illuminated, but it reflects the light. It doesn't have heat in itself. Look at the precision. 14 centuries ago, who knew? In, era, in Arabia, who knew that the moon reflects the light and does not have its own light? This was not something known by the Arabs at the time. But look at the precision of the Holy Quran. These are amazing examples that you find in the wording of the Quran. Another example is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the people of the cave, Ashab al-Kahf. Allah says, how long did they stay in the cave? The verse says, they stayed in the cave 300 years and they also added 9 years. Wazdadu tis'an. Some people did not understand what this verse is saying. Why? Is there, is, a, is there a historical dispute? Some say 300, some say 309. Why does the Quran say that? Why is that significant? Subhanallah, today the exegetes of the Quran, they say that's a reference to the two types of calendars. If you measure their time by the solar calendar, it's 300 years. But if you, if you measure the time in the lunar calendar, how much will it be? 309 years. Because the lunar calendar is based on about 355 days. Whereas the solar calendar is based off around 365 days. So over a period of 300 years, you have a difference of 9 years. The Quran is giving us the time in both calendars. And look at the precision of the Holy Quran. Another example that I would like to share with you is how phonetically the Quran really gave this extra layer of eloquence. Even the sounds of the words were mesmerizing to the Arabs. Allah is delivering guidance, but the sound of the verses was something that the Arabs could not produce anything like. Sometimes if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about a concept, if Allah wants to tell you that the concept is a pleasant concept, Allah uses pleasant sounding words. And if Allah wants to give you a concept that's rough, that's tough, that's unpleasant, Allah uses difficult sounding words. I'll give you an example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about hidayah to Islam. فَمَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهِ أَنْ يَهْدِيَهُ يَشْرَحْ صَدْرَهُ لِلْإِسْلَامِ Did you hear that? يَشْرَحْ صَدْرَهُ لِلْإِسْلَامِ if Allah wants to guide you, He opens your chest for Islam. The idea communicated here is a pleasant one. So the words are not difficult to pronounce. For an Arabic speaker, they, they flow beautifully. But then, look at the example that Allah gives us in the following statement. وَمَن يُرِدْ أَنْ يُضِلَّهُ And Allah, if Allah wants to misguide you, meaning... He sees that you don't want guidance, so Allah doesn't give you the success for guidance. What does Allah say? يَجْعَلْ صَدْرَهُ ضَيِّقًا حَرَجًا كَأَنَّمَا يَصَّعَدُ فِي السَّمَاءِ Did you hear that? Even if you know nothing of Arabic, compare between the two. يَشْرَحْ صَدْرَهُ لِلْإِسْلَامِ يَجْعَلْ صَدْرَهُ ضَيِّقًا حَرَجًا كَأَنَّمَا يَصَّعَدُ فِي السَّمَاءِ It's difficult to pronounce it. Why? Because Allah says, if you're misguided, you're like the one whose chest is tight. It's as if you're suffocating, you're rising with altitude. You're suffocating. Even the sound of the word helps you with the meaning, subhanAllah. Who could produce something like that other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? By the way, there's a scientific miracle here. In Arabia, there were not mountains high enough for anyone to experience a reduction in oxygen when you would rise in altitude. No one knew that in Arabia. But the Quran says, it's like you rise towards the sky in altitude. The more you rise in altitude, the less oxygen. You could get suffocated. You get deprived of oxygen. Who knew that other than the Prophet ﷺ seeking his knowledge from Allah? No one in Arabia knew that. There were not airplanes for them to go and experience higher altitudes. No one had gone to Mount Everest at the time to experience it. And this is another miracle found in this verse. So you see phonetically how even the sound of the verses, subhanAllah, help you with the content of it. This is one example. 
Another fascinating example of the Quran, my dear brothers and sisters, is that the Quran composes words using heavy letters, but when you put them together, they flow so smoothly. In Arabic, one of the heavy that one of the heaviest letters are M and the Qaf, the Mim and the Qaf. Because when you say M, you have to use your entire mouth, right? I'll give you an example. In English, say mammoth. You can say it. I'm not saying you are not able to say it. You can easily say it. But there is that heaviness on the tongue. Mammoth. Now say the word love. Which one's easier to say? Mammoth, love, right? You see that when you say an M, especially if you have multiple M's, it becomes a little bit heavy on the tongue because the letter M in Arabic and a number of languages is considered a heavy letter. Harf thaqil. The word qaf is also a difficult letter. In fact, many non-Arabic speakers have difficulty even saying the letter qaf. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one verse in the Holy Quran, He uses 16 M's without you feeling any difficulty on your tongue. For instance, look at this beautiful verse in Surah Hud. And that's verse 48. There are 16 M's. And if you want to count the rules of Tajweed and the Idgham, how sometimes you make an N into an M, it becomes 21 M's. But see how it flows. I'll read it for you. Even if you know nothing of Arabic, just listen to it and you'll see the power of the Quran. Allah is addressing Prophet Nuh salam after the flood, after the incident of the ark. Allah tells him, Qila ya Nuh, ihbit bi salamin minna wa barakatin alayk. Here's where it gets interesting. Wa ala umamin mimma ma'ak. Did you hear that? Do you know how many M's we have over here? Especially if you want to observe Tajweed, we have eight M's. Give me a word with eight M's that will not twist your tongue in any language. Only Allah can do it. Did you feel any heaviness? Say it. There are eight M's embedded in this part of the verse. But you don't feel any difficulty. You don't feel any burden on the tongue. See how Allah would arrange these letters and the Arabs, when they saw this, they were fascinated. Who other than the Prophet can do this? And remember, the Quran was not written. The Quran was orally transmitted. And the Prophet is receiving sometimes these verses in the battle, when he's tired, when he's traveling. When did he sit and put this all together and experiment and see which kind of word is going to sound better than the other? This is the work of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَعَلَىٰ أُمَمٍ مِمَّا مَعَكِ وَأُمَمٌ سَنُمَتِّعُهُمْ وَأُمَمٌ سَنُمَتِّعُهُمْ ثُمَّ يَمَسُّهُمْ مِنَّا عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ 16 M's in this verse. But you can read it without feeling any heaviness on your tongue. Even though the letter M is a heavy letter. I'll read it one more time. قِيلَ يَا نُوحُ اهْبِطْ بِسَلَامٍ مِنَّا وَبَرَكَاتٍ عَلَيْكِ وَعَلَىٰ أُمَمٍ مِمَّا مَعَكِ it flows beautifully. This is another example. Another example is the letter Qaf. There's a verse in the Holy Quran, short verse, that repeats the letter Qaf ten times. But you don't feel any difficulty in it. And this is in Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse 27. Ten times. Allah is talking about Qabil trying to kill his brother Habil. Tell them about the story of the sons of Adam, how one of them wanted to kill the other one. Did you hear that? The word, the letter Qaf is a very heavy letter. Qaf, you have to kind of use your whole throat to say it. Allah uses it 10 times in one verse, in one statement. You don't feel any heaviness on it. And the Arabs, when they would hear that, they were mind boggled. They were fascinated. What is this Quran that can do this? And 
and this is just to give you my dear brothers and sisters some glimpses there there is many the list goes on I can sit here for hours and share with you the power in the verses and why Allah uses this word and the precision in some of these words but indeed the Holy Quran was miraculous at every level scientifically in terms of its eloquence and literary powers in terms of its content in terms of its predictions in terms of its elaborate law how did a man who was unschooled bring this to humanity? And for 1,400 years, people have been trying to challenge the Qur'an, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects the Holy Qur'an. The month of Ramadan is the month of Qur'an, my dear brothers and sisters. And this month, let's develop a relationship with the Book of Allah, especially our youngsters. When your child is young, let them interact with the words of God. These are the words of Allah. They bring healing to us, my dear brothers and sisters. Allah says, you want healing? Spiritual healing? Healing of the heart? It's in the Quran. Some people say, yeah, but I don't understand how. How is it that if I read the Quran or contemplate the Quran, it will give me healing? One scholar gave an interesting example. He said when you go to the doctor and you have an infection, let's say in your ear, you need antibiotics. What is your doctor going to prescribe to you? He'll prescribe to you antibiotics. Take this once a day or every eight hours depending on the type of antibiotics you're taking. Swallow it with food and you'll be fine. Now imagine if someone tells the doctor, doctor, I don't understand. I told you my ear is hurting, not my stomach. Why are you giving me a pill that I'm eating? I want something for my ear. How silly would that sound, right? The doctor will tell you, look, I know how a pill works. Don't worry. Wherever you have an infection, the pill will do its job. Even though you don't know exactly how it's working. Eat the pill, it will treat your ear. Allah says, take my Quran. Anywhere there's a disease in the heart, there's a disease of jealousy, there's a disease of arrogance, there's a disease of hatred, Allah will cure it through, through the Holy Quran. Because the Quran is the ultimate cure, my dear brothers and sisters. Let our children live with the Holy Quran. One feature about the children of Imam Hussein salam, even though they were young, the three-year-old Fatima to Sughra in Karbala, the man walks up to her, he asks her, who are you? She tells him, have you heard of this verse? As for the orphan, do not harm. They had memorized, even the kids of Imam Hussein, they had memorized. He's like, yes, I've read this verse. She's like, I am Yatima at Abi Abdullah al Hussein. I am the orphan daughter of Imam al Hussein. They would always cite the Holy Quran because they lived with the Quran. Don't say my child doesn't understand doesn't fully know Arabic, how is he or she going to know the Quran? The Quran does its job, my dear brothers and sisters. When you give a pill to your child, does your pill understand what medicine is, what biology is, what an infection is? It does its job. Let, the, let your children live with the Holy Quran. Yes, explain to them the meanings. Show them how to apply the Quran. But never say that since my child doesn't know the Quran, it won't benefit them. There was once a grandfather. He had a six-year-old grandchild. He wanted to teach him the Qur'an, but he was kind of rebellious. He would tell him, Grandfather, I don't fully understand this Qur'an. I don't understand all these verses. Why should I know them? Why should I read them? Why should I memorize them? One day his grandfather took him to the river. They were carrying a basket with charcoal in it to have a good time and to do some barbecue. So once they emptied the basket from the charcoal, it became black. It was a white, beautiful basket. It became black. His grandfather told him, my dear grandson, I have a task for you. I have a challenge for you. Take this basket, go to the river, fill it with water, and run as fast as you can before the water spills. He's like, can I do this? He's like, yeah, try. Inshallah, you can so he goes, he fills up the basket with water. He's running back, but obviously he can't do that. By the time he got to his grandfather, there was no water in the basket. It has holes all over pores. Obviously the water is not going to be contained. He said, grandfather, I couldn't. He's like, you need to run a little bit faster next time. So he goes to the river, he fills it up, he runs faster, but he doesn't make it in time. He gets frustrated. His grandfather tells him one more time, Habibi, one more time. Maybe you need to run a little bit faster. He says, okay. 
So he comes the third time. He's panicking, gasping for air, running as fast as he could. But by the time he gets to his grandfather, the water has emptied. He gets frustrated. He throws the basket. He tells him, Grandfather, what are you doing? You know I can't. His grandfather tells him, My dear son, look at the basket. How does it look now? He looked at the basket. It looked pure, shining white. He told him, what happened to all the blackness of the charcoal? He says, the river purified it. It washed it. He told him, my dear grandson, do you see this basket? It did not have the capacity to contain the water because there were pores in it. So you couldn't contain the water. But the water passed through the basket and it purified it. My dear grandson, yes, maybe you think your heart is too small to contain the Holy Quran, the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let the Quran run through your heart. It will purify your heart. And his grandson said, yes. Now, I love this example. I'm going to read the Quran. Even if you don't fully, fully understand the Quran, you don't know the tafsir, you can't read Arabic to go, it's fine. Start by embracing this book and making it a part of your life, my dear brothers and sisters. Our rank on the Day of Judgment depends on how much we know the Qur'an and practice the Qur'an. Because the degrees of paradise are arranged according to the number of verses. The more you practice these verses and you know them, the higher Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will elevate you. In fact, the Qur'an is so powerful, my dear brothers and sisters, that the one who knows the Qur'an very well, who practices the Qur'an, will be given the power of shafa'a on the day of judgment. You know we believe in shafa'a intercession. You could have the power of shafa'a because the hadith states, Man hatta The one who carries the meanings of the Qur'an, not just a parrot who memorizes the Qur'an. No, the one who reads, memorizes and understands the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take him to paradise. That's the first thing. Then the hadith states, وَشَفَّعَهُ فِي عَشَرَةٍ مِّنْ أَهْلِ بَيْتِهِ كُلُّهُمْ قَدْ وَجَبَتْ لَهُمُ النَّارِ Allah will give you the power of shafa'a to save 10 people from your relatives and family. They were destined to hell. Allah will tell you on the day of judgment, you my servant, you were good to my word, you were good to the Qur'an. Go and save 10 people and because of the Qur'an, I will free them from hell. I will forgive them. Let them join you in paradise. This is the power of the Holy Quran, my dear brothers and sisters. Let's live with the Holy Quran. Let's die with the Holy Quran. Let's explore the depths of the Holy Quran. Whether the literary features, the scientific features, the amazing laws, the, ama the amazing words of advice that the Holy Quran gives us. Sometimes one beautiful word of advice from the Holy Quran ch can change your entire life. And the best opportunity is the Holy Quran month of Ramadan. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to illuminate our hearts with the power and nobility and the light of the Holy Quran. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin. Allahumma salli ala